Please welcome International Director, Distinguished Toastmaster, Teresa Dukes. Good morning, Washington, D.C. We are in for a wonderful adventure today. Manuj Wasudevan, he is a renowned leadership coach and management consultant. And he has more than two decades of experience working with major multinational companies in Asia, Australia, North America, and Europe. As a transformational coach, Manuj has coached C-level executives, senior executives, bureaucrats, management consultants, celebrities, United Nations diplomats, entrepreneurs, and other professionals. I'm not sure what's left. In 2015, Manuj won third place in the World Championship of Public Speaking at Toastmasters International Convention in Las Vegas. Woo! In 2012, he was among the top 25 stand-up comedians at the International Comedy Festival in Hong Kong. Currently, he's the CEO of Thought Expressions, a professional training and coaching company based in Singapore. Manoj has spoken in 14 cities across the world, delivering speeches that are eye-opening, engaging, energizing, and entertaining. He's here today to share with us his internationally acclaimed leadership keynote that demonstrates how to adopt your mindset of an effective leader, how to improve your team's performance, and how to be a leader others choose to follow. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Manu's Wasudevan. Raise your hand if you think you are a leader. Let me see. Some people have raised their hands. Some are waiting for others to take the lead. <laughs> Some are not sure whether they are leaders. And others are waiting for me to repeat the question. Years ago, I used to have the similar confusion. Am I a leader? Can I become a leader? And over the years, it became clearer and clearer. Today, I am going to share with you a proven path towards leadership. A path that will make you a leader. Others will admire and follow. But before I tell you about the path, let me tell you how I found it. 18 years ago, I used to work for a large multinational company. Of course, back then, I used to have more hair. More hair than Ed Tate. <laughs> it was curly hair, believe me. And you remember he said all the girls who went to him and look at him? After that, they came running towards me. <laughs> now Ed is looking at me and say, Suki, Suki. <laughs> He say, if you say one more joke on me, after this talk, I'm going to pass you around like a joint. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> back then, when I joined this company, I got recruited uh, for an expertise in a certain domain. And the job was well. It was a good job. I was happy. I used to get, get paid well. 
I used to get promotions and new positions every year, and I was very happy. Then one day, everything stopped. No new positions, no promotions, no pay raise. So I went to my boss and said, hey, how come you never gave me a promotion or a pay raise? Why did it stop? And he looked at me right in the eye and said, Manoj, you don't have what it takes to go to the next level. You have reached your potential. As I walked back home that day, I was very disappointed and frustrated, but I was not really angry with him because at least he was very honest with me. I was not sure what I should do. So what do you do when you need some directions? I asked my friends. And they gave me this wisdom. They said, Manoj, if you want to succeed in your career, you need to get an MBA. I said, all right. So I dipped in my savings, took thousands of dollars, and went to Imperial College London to do my MBA. Two years later, and tens of thousands of dollars later, nothing changed in my career. Of course, I did learn new things and also made new friends, but nothing tangible, no tangible change. That's when I, for the very first time in my life, took a step back and started to observe people who are successful in their personal life and in their professional lives. And more I observed them, I realized there are five skills that you need to have to succeed in your personal life and in your professional lives. These were skills I was lacking back then. These are what I call the power of five. An ability to connect, an ability to communicate, an ability to network, an ability to lead, and an ability to sell your views and ideas. I was tempted and I did indeed in the end left the job and I started my own consulting and over the years I started three companies and in those positions I got the unique opportunity and I was fortunate to work with people from 46 different nationalities people who are different from me I got to work with them interact with them and learn from them then later as an executive leadership coach and as a public speaking coach, I got to work with people from all walks of life, people from 27 nationalities. But the interesting part was, I didn't plan for this, but as I coached, actually I was learning from my clients' experiences, challenges, and stories. And I was amazed. The most important thing I learned was this. Most people in high positions are ordinary people like you and me. As you heard, I, I, I was in the World Championship of Public Speaking last year, but many people do not know, I used to be terrified to speak. I couldn't even speak in front of 20 people. Then of course I learned from my coaches and mentors and learning shortcuts and techniques, and I became a better speaker. And since then, I go around the world trying to tell people, you too can be a better speaker. You too can be a better leader. And that I found to my calling to go around and help people to unlock their potential. Now, my, based on my research and my conversations with leaders and my observations, I agree that some people are truly exceptional. They are born with certain traits, talents, and gifts that make them special. They, you drop them into a group and they automatically emerge as a leader. These are what I call leaders by birth. Born leaders. Now the question is this, what if you are not born with those gifts, talents and traits? Do you still stand a chance? to be a leader others admire and follow? Fortunately, the answer is yes. In fact, most people who we admire as leaders 
did not start off as leaders. They picked up certain skills, behaviors, and techniques, and attitudes of mind that under the right circumstances transformed them from ordinary people to extraordinary leaders. Now the question is, and these people are what I call leaders by design. Now the question is, how does someone become a leader by design? Or more specifically, what can you do, what steps can you take to become a leader others will admire and follow? I was searching for an answer for years. In the end, what I found was different from what I read in leadership books. A slightly different perspective and a slightly different set of leadership lessons. In fact, these leadership lessons can be summarized in a folk tale my father used to tell me. It's called The Mouse Trap. Allow me to tell you the tale. As you listen to this tale, think about your life. Think about your life experiences. Think about the people you have met in your life and try to guess what the leadership lessons could be. Here is the story. A long, long time ago, there lived a poor farmer. This poor farmer lived in a small house with his wife. One day, the poor farmer bought a mouse trap. Now, the mouse of the house, he looked out of this mouse hole and he saw this mouse trap and he said, Oh my God, there's a mouse trap in the house. He got, he panicked, he ran out. Well, he saw the hen, the goat, and the cow. He went to the hen and said, Hen, hen, there's a mouse trap in the house. There's a mouse trap in the house. And the hen said, Why are you telling me this? It is, this is not my problem. So he went to the goat and said, Mr. Goat, Mr. Goat. I'm not calling you the goat. <laughs> There's no resemblance. <laughs> Just believe me. He said, Mr. Goat, Mr. Goat, there's a mouse trap in the house. There's a mouse trap in the house. And the goat said, hey, why are you telling me this? This is not my problem. So the mouse went to the cow and said, cow, cow, holy cow. There's a mouse trap in the house. There's a mouse trap in the house. And the cow said, Have you ever heard a cow being trapped in a mouse trap? <laughs> Go away, this is not my problem. Ladies and gentlemen, there was a mouse trap in the house. Everybody heard about it. Most of them ignored it because it was not their problem. That night, bang, something got trapped in the mouse trap. The farmer's wife, she sprang up from her bed and said, hey, finally I got that mouse. And she ran into the kitchen. It was pitch dark. She stooped down to pick up the mouse. But it was not a mouse that was trapped in a mouse trap. It was a snake. The snake bit the farmer's wife. And she yelled out in pain, and the farmer came running in with a lantern, and he killed the snake. But the damage was already done. The farmer's wife fell ill. Now, what's a good medicine for high fever? Don't say go to Walgreens. The poor farmer slaughtered the hen and fed his wife with chicken soup. Now the news spread, and friends and relatives came to visit the farmer's wife. And to feed them, the poor farmer slaughtered the goat. Unfortunately, two days later, the farmer's wife passed away. The entire village came for the funeral. And to feed them, the poor farmer slaughtered the As an Indian, I am not allowed to kill the cow. I always let the audience do that. <laughs> 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 
now the farmer said, oh my God, my stupid decision to buy that mouse trap destroyed my whole sense of livelihood. He had lost almost everything. And he became sad and lonely and depressed. He had no motivation or interest to work. Three months later, the poor farmer passed away. That's the end of the story. <laughs> now, my question is, what are the lessons? You want to shout out some answers? Yes? Yes? What's that? Oh, animals should have cared. Anything else? Don't buy a mouse trap. Yes, you want to shout? Okay, the problem comes to you. Well, last one, last one, yes. Be proactive. All right, I'll get back to you on that, okay? Uh, you want to say something? You raise your hand. Oh, any problem could be good. It's interesting how uh, I speak, speak about this in many cities, and depending on the country, the answer is always different. Last time I spoke in the U.S., someone said, have a light bulb in the kitchen. <laughs> I think it was in Indonesia, someone said, don't marry a hyperactive wife. <laughs> <laughs> and then a lady interrupted and said, it's a farmer's problem. He should not have bought the mousetrap. He should have just bought a cat. What I've done is I have derived 18 leadership lessons from the mousetrap. I got so excited about it, I even wrote books on this topic. So if Toastmasters is where leaders are made, the mousetrap way is trying to show how leaders are made. Or rather how, or what do you need to do to become a leader, others will admire and follow. These are quite extensive lessons. Since we don't have that much time, I have picked five lessons that you can take away today and put into practice right away. You see, the mouse trap initially didn't look like a problem for the hen, the goat, and the cow. But in the end, it only affected the hen, the goat, and the cow. Whenever something happens, no matter how remote, no matter how insignificant, no matter how improbable, it has a potential to affect us. Let's not ignore that. Whether it's in your team, in your club, in your organization, when something goes wrong, it's not just the problem of the team leader or the CEO or the club president. It's a problem for every one of us to solve, to come together and solve. Because when you're in a team, somebody's problem is everybody's problem. Somebody's problem is everybody's problem. You see, the mousetrap represents both the risk and the reward. The trap is the risk, and the cheese is the reward. If you look at any great leader worth his or her salt, there are people who have taken ownership of some problem and got involved to find a solution. Most people don't want to get involved because of the risks involved. That's what... I want to get at the first lesson is ownership. Ownership is at the core of leadership. In fact, ownership is the habit that leads to leadership. Mo if, raise your hand if you know someone who avoids ownership. Now raise your hand if you, that person is in, the, in this room. <laughs> Don't point to that person. <laughs> Now raise your hand if that person is you. Now, there are a lot of people who don't want to take ownership, but that's at the core of leadership and also the habit that takes us to leadership positions. 
I remember as a speech contestant, I used to go around the world practicing in different clubs. I probably attended some 100 uh, club meetings. There are some clubs, it looks good on the website. When you go there, there are not many people in the room, right? So I don't know which club is good, right? So I need to look at the website. So I sometimes ask the president and say, hey, how come your membership is so low? And if it's an irresponsible president, he or she will say, oh, oh membership is not me. You ask vice president membership. <laughs> and I go to vice president membership and say, hey, how come your membership is so low? Oh, 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 that's because the vice president public relations didn't bring enough guests. And it goes on and on. And nobody's problem. There is a reason for every season, and it's almost treason when you're working in a team. Because it weakens the team, and at the end, everybody loses. It's interesting. I still remember the first time I took part in the international speech contest. I lost, and, um, but I was very disappointed. And I sat there, somebody came to me, tapped on my shoulder and said, what if I tell you a way to still stay in the contest? You can go to the ADL level. I said, how? It was rather like, how much? <laughs> he said, I know about a weak club. You can join that club, and you can compete there, and you can still stay in the contest. I said, all right. So I joined the club. The first day I went for the club meeting, it was the contest. Ten people in the room. Only one other contestant. I competed, and I lost. <laughs> the table topics contest. And I won the international speech contest. I was very happy. I took the trophy, and I had it right for the door. And as I went, a lady stopped me and said, Manoj, can you be our next president? I, I said, why me? Oh, we only have 17 members, and nobody wants a job. I said, still, why me? I just joined to take part in the contest. I had nothing to do with this club. I'm going. And she asked this question. Don't you want to serve your club, huh? I said, OK. So immediately, there was an election. We elected the club officers. The election went something like this, because nobody was volunteering. So it was supposed to be, it goes like this. Vice President membership, Vijay, say yes. Vice Pre Lance Miller, Vice President, Education, say yes. Don't you want to serve the club? <laughs> I'm going to talk to your wife now. <laughs> so eventually the team was formed. And that day I went back home. And I went home. when I went home, my kids were very happy. Oh, dad is now president. Like Obama. And the next time I came for the meeting, seven members had left the club, <laughs> including four club officers. <laughs> now I was like trapped in a mouse trap. <laughs> I had two choices, to stay or to run away. Fortunately, I chose to stay. And that one decision would make an amazing impact on my life and I'll share with you the details a little bit later. So what I'm trying to get at is, and this is what I tell my team, if you always want directions to operate, you can't be a leader. You're only a follower. You need to be willing to take initiative without directive. And this is one thing I tell, remind myself and my teams, because giving excellence is a habit. Giving excuse is also a habit. Don't make, don't give excuse, give excellence. So the first lesson is ownership. What's the first lesson? Ownership. The next lesson. What did the mouse do when he saw the mouse trap? Sorry? He communicated, yes? Fear. Sorry, ask for help. 
Sorry? Just hungry. Angry. Oh, he's angry, yes. So, what's that? Wife. I got people to solve this problem. He told people about it. <laughs> we got a lot of fun with this. Now, one answer is what I was looking for, and I heard that, is the mouse panicked. As a leader, if you panic, nobody would want to be near you. Everyone would want to avoid you. Because a time of crisis is not a time to panic. It's a time to be calm, confident, and communicate. You see, the point I'm getting is, is, oh, somebody said he ate the cheese. So, is coming up. Oh, can he? Okay, so this is the scene. Somebody drew the scene. Confidence. I say competence is important. Confidence is paramount. I'm not saying you don't need to have the com competence. But the problem I see is most people are always chasing qualifications after qualifications, certificates after certificates, Degrees after degrees, but they don't have the confidence. They don't build up their confidence because competence is useless without confidence and action. Because if you look at any social interaction, the person with a higher confidence or greater confidence has the upper hand. The greater your confidence, greater your advantage. Raise your hand if you think more confidence can help you. Yeah? Thank you. You see... Someone said this, the problem in this world is, with the, is that the people with competence doesn't have the confidence, and idiots seem to have all the confidence. <laughs> what I'm saying is this, you need to have the confidence and the belief that your cost is significant, your talent is sufficient, and your time has come. Because if you wait for the right time, right opportunity, Right place, your time might never come. Someone would have taken your cake and eaten it too. Now, if you look at the, all the great leaders we rave about now, Mahatma Gandhi or Dr. Martin Luther King, Dr. Mandela, and thousands of uh, countless men and women around the world, I do not believe when they started, they had all the competence. They just knew that I need to get involved. They didn't want to... Um, sit around waiting for things to happen. They want to get involved and make things happen. And when they started, I don't think they had all the confidence or the competence. But they just took the first step and they got involved. Their competence grew, their confidence grew, and the results started to show. It's never the other way around. But most people are waiting for the right opportunities, the right circumstances, and the perfect circumstances doesn't exist. I still remember last year, I got an invite to speak in front of 20,000 people. It's huge. I was supposed to give a speech and host the event for like five hours. Never done that before. And on top of these 20,000 people, there was live streaming. And later I knew that millions were watching. It's a television streaming. I said yes. But the event was in 48 hours. Two days. I didn't have the time to... But I said yes. So I went home. And I sat down, I said, and they started giving me instructions and changes. And I said, oh my God, why did they even say yes? What was I thinking? Of course, I said, because I keep saying confidence is paramount. So I had to, so then I said, oh, maybe uh, this is going to be a, this is a mistake. I said, I, I, I'm going to lose my reputation. Everyone is going to know about this. So I was sitting at home and said, I don't want to do this. And my 11-year-old son, he comes to me, looks up and says, Daddy, if you don't want to do, shall I do it? <laughs> I said, you never have done that. What are you going to do? He said, Daddy, this is such a rare chance. I'll figure it out. <laughs> and that really resonated with me. And even today, sometimes I get invited to some international conferences. And one of the things I do is look at who else is speaking. Sometimes I see these big corporate leaders who are speaking, and there's my name. And I said, why me? They're surely making a mistake. <laughs> this is a mistake. But 
This is what is called an imposter syndrome. Most people have that. In fact, I think everybody has that. Most, very few people admit that. We all have imposter syndromes. But the point is you find a way to overcome that, to boost your confidence, look confident. I have a way. Some people, when I get invited to conference, and they say, oh, you should be so excited, right? Oh, how do you feel? I said, I'm fine. I'm fine. And fine means freaked out, <laughs> insecure, nervous, and excited. I'm fine. I'm not saying you should not be prepared. You need to be prepared. Of course, I am prepared. My speech is there. Slide is there. I have a little note on my pocket. If I forget, I can flip, take it out. I have my whole script here. If I, <laughs> So you need to be prepared. <laughs> yeah? So that's the thing. So confidence. What's the second lesson? What's the second lesson? Confidence. That sounds more confident. That's more confident, okay? Now, what did the mouse say when he saw the mouse trap? Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a mouse trap in the house. That's right. What else? Hmm? He said cheese. Maybe the audio is not right then that side of the room. So let's say that again. Okay. I need to update my script with that line. <laughs> Thank you. So what I'm going to get at is ideas infusion. Most people kind of tell me that they have a lot of ideas. But what I figure out is having, I think almost everybody, everybody has ideas. In fact, there are books written in, about it uh, about that everybody has ideas. The point is having ideas is not enough. You need to be able to infuse ideas. You need to be able to convey your ideas in a way that people take it in and they start running with it. I met a CEO of a very large multinational bank, and one, one, he shared with me how he recruits his team of uh, managing directors. He said, I let the human resources recruit and do um, pre preliminary levels of uh, selection and elimination. And then when the managing director comes and sits in front of me, I tell him or her, basically what I'm doing is I transfer my vision of my, the company into their mind. Thereafter, they became ambassadors of the idea and they run with it. You see, real leaders may or may not have followers, but they're always creating new leaders. And ideas infusion is one part of it. Now, there are only three ways to communicate as a leader. What are the three ways to communicate? Three things. You can tell. You can yell, or you can sell. So selling is in, you say it in a way that people buy your ideas and run with. And how do you sell your ideas in a way that people buy and run with? Of course, there's a lot of research done on this topic. You look at sales, marketing, advertising, public relations, leadership. I review a lot of um, this communication. And what I find is there are six infusion points, what I call infusion points. These are things that triggers people, stirs people into action. The six infusion points are pleasure, profit, power, productivity, prestige, and purpose. The, think of this as like hot buttons, the things that resonates with people. Of this, the most powerful is purpose. And it's hard to reach. I'll elaborate on that for a bit, minute. You see, if you were to give someone a greater purpose to live up to, or give them a work that resonates with their purpose in life, they will not only work for you, they can even work for you for free. Do you agree with that? Do you know about any organization where people work late <laughs> nights, on weekends, travel great distances to be somewhere for someone and never get paid for it? Do you know any organization? <laughs> what organization? I heard Toastmasters. Oh, yeah. Maybe. In fact, Toastmasters goes one step forward. You pay membership fee to be a member. <laughs> <laughs> so in this yeah, example of your paying to work for free, just think about it. That's the true genius of leadership. How you can get people 
give them a greater purpose to live up to and they become ambassadors of the idea and run with it. And when you are leading a team, think about how you can get your team together and get them to work on a common purpose. Now, who is good in mathematics? All right. So people are not good in mathematics will have trouble doing this exercise. And I, what I want to do you to do is take a piece of paper, pen and pencil, or if you do not have a piece of paper, you can use your phone. You need to write down a few names. Okay? I'll give you five seconds to figure that out. You can write, you know, there's a piece of paper, or you can do it on your phone. And if you're very good in memory, you can use your memory as well. This is what I want you to do. Write down the names of five of your best friends, excluding family and relatives. Write down the names of five of your best friends, excluding family and relatives. Done? Now I'll give you another five seconds. This is a mathematical test. Very complex. Done? Somebody has done very fast. Yeah, okay. So don't look at the uh, names of the person. Maybe your name won't be there. <laughs> you might be sitting with your best friend, but they don't think you're a friend. Go with what you have, okay? Or oh, five of your closest friends. All right? Look at the list. Is there anyone who is from your home country? It's the same country as you are from. Okay, very excellent. Strike off those names. Is there anyone who belongs to the same race or ethnicity? Is there? Okay, yeah. Strike off those names. Is the, on the list, is there anyone who is of the same gender? Strike off those names. Is there anyone from the same religion you follow? Strike off those names. Now, the number you got, you need to multiply that with 20. <laughs> and the number you get is what I call your DQ, your diversity quotient. So if you want to do another way, some people say it's not fair to say five friends. You can write 100 friends and start doing the same thing. The result is the same. Look around the room. There are a lot of people who are different from us. Diversity is your reality. I live in Singapore. Oh, I'll let the snake come down. Yeah, safe. All right, I live in Singapore. And who has been to Singapore? Some people have not. Nobody is perfect. <laughs> it's a very small country. Tw if you were to draw a square, 25 square, 25 kilometers by 25 square, 25 kilometers times 25 kilometers, that's roughly the size of 15 miles times 15 miles. Very small place. 5.7 million people there. It's very crowded, more crowded than most cities you know. There are people from almost every country representing every culture, every religion, every background who work and live in Singapore. This is a social concern and this is also a political concern because too many people in too small place creates, makes it crowded put a stretch on resources and that's a people complain about that i see possibilities i see opportunities because 100 years from now this is exactly how our cities will look like people from various countries communities and cultures converging on cities to work together and live together whether you like it or not Diversity is your reality. Whether you want it or not, 
diversity is here to stay. It will not go away. Now, what I'm, what's the impact for us? Globally, you and me will be fo forced to work with people who are different from us. We need to learn to adapt to this. I'm not even saying that you should tolerate diversity. I'm not even saying that you should encourage diversity. I'm saying you should consciously embrace diversity. There's a guy by the name of Richard Crisp. He's one of the world's leading social psychologist. As I wrote my book, I was referred to him. And he says this, embracing diversity in your social world has two aspects. One, it awakens our creative potential. Two, it maximizes our creative potential. And I can relate to that. Whenever I do something, I put it up in front of people from different backgrounds. And you're amazed by the number of advices and perspectives we get. And then people come to me and say, I'm creative. I said, I'm not creative, I'm diverse. I'm trying to get input from different people. Simple thing, last week I lost my voice. And I put a post on Facebook saying, what should I do? And I got inputs from different people. Now I can do a two hour keynote on how to manage your voice. Amazing, it's something I never thought about. Yeah, so think about that, how we can do that. So people ask me, how, what, what should we do? How, what, how, what should I do to improve my diversity quotient? Reach out to people who are different from us. You see, if you notice, we are part of an organization which is one of the most diverse in the history of mankind. And this gives us a lot of opportunities. And somebody came to me uh, last time, I said, so what should I do? Do I go to someone and say, hey, you look different from me. Can I be your friend? <laughs> I said, it's far easier than that. It's far easier than that. Be authentic, be open, be human, be nice. People will flock to you. All right? Now, I don't think we have time for Q&A, but I'll just, any question? Okay, all right. We'll catch the place. So, Coming to the next one, what happened? So I'm going to, oh, I forgot a very key thing I want to say. Take a look at the palm of your hands. Oh, in, I hope you have two hands, so just look at right, any hand is fine. Other, what, whichever hand you have. All right, look at the hand. There are five fingers. All the fingers look different. One is fat, one is short, one is straight, one is not so straight. It comes with different shapes, sizes, and different colors and shapes. In fact, there's 50 shades of brown. A finger by itself is not strong. A finger by itself has no meaning, unless it's the middle finger. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, no, I, I mean the thumb, thumb, unless it's the, but if you were to crawl your fingers into a fist, that's where you get the power of the punch. So try to liberate the different points of view, diverse views, the, tal the diverse talents, and you bring it together, you will maximize your potential. There's no doubt about it. Real leaders realize that. Now, the next point, I'm gonna to skip to the last lesson. Number 18, what happened to the mouse? Which character is left at the end of the story? The mouse. So what happened to the mouse? Survived. The mouse became the boss of the house. <laughs> so those pictures with all the other animals on the wall, the farmer wife, the mouse hole is for rent. What the mouse do to become the boss? Actually, practically nothing. So the point is, sometimes you don't have to do anything to end up in leadership positions. <laughs> Someone told me, oh, that explains my, why my boss got that promotion. 
So the point is this. You are never too small to be big. You're never too small to be big. But the question is, when you end up in those leadership positions, are you ready to leave? There's a man, this gentleman by the name Marshall Goldsmith. I don't know whether you heard about him. He is regarded as the number one leadership thinker in the world. He uh, coaches the leaders of the top 100 companies in the world. Highly respected. He wrote a book by the title, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. What Got You Here Won't Get You There. New York Times number one bestseller. I would recommend that you read it. It says how we need to be ready to get to the next level and keep on moving because there are some blind spots we are not aware of. He talks about 20 blind spots. Most people are not aware of that. The more you know, you fix that, you go ahead. Do you remember the time I said I was the club president? So what happened that year was we closed the year, we increased the membership by 300%. We won two district trophies. We was regarded as one of the best clubs in our district. Later, we were known as the club of champions. We produced leaders who went on to start 10 clubs. It's not how great I am. Is that how it happens when you get people together? One of the things we did was to tell every member, the, the ex, we, we call it the exco, the executive committee. The club is not the exco, and the exco is not the club. We are all in this together. We all have equal share on this club. We need to work together. Once we work together, magic happens. The reason I mentioned that story is because one of the things I did in the club was to share the mouse trap story. So the story has shared, I was, uh, of course, in a very older version of the story, I spoke about why we need to work together. What happened is that this, I thought the speech was awesome <laughs> because I started speaking about the Arab Spring, and this was 2011, I speak about how the Arab Spring is going to do not a local problem, it's going to go all over the world, it's going to come to our doorstep. And I thought I was very brilliant. So what I did is I took the video and up uploaded it onto YouTube. I was very sure it's going to go viral. Two million views, I thought. Two years later, I looked at it, only 200 views, <laughs> including <laughs> my views. <laughs> and I, of course, sent the link to some people. They also watched the views. What happened later, I took down the video. I converted that into a keynote speech for corporates. I spoke once, I spoke twice, I spoke the third time I spoke, somebody in the back of the room, Mr. Lim, he came to me and said, Manoj, where can I buy your book? I said, there's no book. And he said, I'm 65 years old. When you reach my age, you can't be, have the energy to write. If you want to write. Then later I wrote the book. Then I got invited for a Toastmasters conference. I delivered the speech, and I was waiting outside. A man, gentleman came to me. His name is Ted. He said, oh, when he told me the story, I really connected with that. Because you know, when I joined the, uh, my club on the same day, I was elected as the president. <laughs> and then from there on, I don't know what to do as a president. But I did my best. Then they gave me another job. I did that. Then they gave me another job. I did that. I kept on doing that, and one day I became the international president of Toastmasters. The person is who? Ted Corcoran. Ted Corcoran. So I just, I don't know whether he's seen this room. Is Ted in the room? I see him. I mean, oh yeah, Ted is right there. Well, give it up to Ted! So, this is amazing. So this thing is, so he said he never imagined to be the president. All he did was words up right in front of him and do the very best. Ownership, giving excellence is a habit. For me, what happens, it's always a journey. I'm not the world's expert in, I keep learning. In fact, next week I got invited for an international human resources conference. I looked at the sheet, they put my name as a thought leader on uh, human resources, how we should 
reshape human resources. And look at all the names. They're the big names in world, from the world over. And I said, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> there, and some, so this is a trick. See, and uh, this is for who, those who want to do professional speaking. Actually, professional speaking is kind of easy because you speak and you leave, right? Nobody can catch you. <laughs> <laughs> but in this conference, after the speech, they asked me to sit on a panel and I take questions from the audience. So, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> uh, then what happened was, a few days ago, Marshall Goldsmith read my book and sent me this uh, kind of endorsement. He said, the mousetrap way shows you what it takes to be a great leader and how to get there. I never started this journey. It was a big moment for me because I couldn't believe it and still can't believe it. But the point is I didn't start to write a book or write a speech or go around the world talk about this. All I tried to do was to find out a way so that I can help me, my children, the people I know, so they don't have to get stuck in their organizations or trying to climb the leadership ladder. So imagine what you could do if you were to take a step ahead. You see, this world is in need of leadership. Look at your club, your community, your country, maybe even in your religion. There are a lot of problems. Those are the mouse traps in your house. Don't ignore it because it can go out of control and affect everyone. And don't think you're too small to get involved. I suggest that you take the confidence and believe that your cause is significant, your talent is sufficient, and your time has come. Because as the folktale tells us, the mouse trap is not just the problem of the mouse. So here is the thing. What I suggest is this. Think like a leader. Act like a leader. Be ready to take ownership and take the lead because you are never too small to be big. Now, if you truly believe in that wisdom, and if you truly believe that you too can become a leader, others will admire and follow. Please stand up. Isn't it fabulous? And I believe that's an idea worth spreading. Thank you. Wasn't that a world-class speech? Please give him another big round of applause. Thank you, thank you. The Mousetrap is in the house, and you will be able to speak with Manaj in the bookstore from 12.30, so please make your way there at 12.30 to spend some more time understanding how you can deal with the Mousetrap. Please, on behalf of Toastmasters International, we would like to present him with this special award. Give him another round of applause. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.